The contaminated blood scandal is described as the biggest treatment disaster in the NHS's history. Anywhere between five and 3,000 people were infected with HIV and hepatitis in the 70s and 80s when they were given blood transfusions. A public inquiry is currently looking at what went wrong and whether there was a cover-up. Later today, it'll hear from former students who were infected at Trelaw School. Dozens of their pupils died after being given a blood clotting treatment called Factor 8 and other contaminated blood products that were imported from the United States. Nicholas Sainsbury went to Trelaw from 1974 to 1980. He found out he'd been infected after he left and he told me how he's feeling ahead of giving evidence tomorrow. Getting really nervous now. Bring back a lot of very difficult memories, a lot of tragedy. But I think the story needs to be told. So I'm proud to do it, mm. not just myself, but for all the people that went to Troy and didn't survive, but also for the other 15 survivors out there. When did you realise that you had been infected? Well, it was when the AIDS crisis started in the 1980s. I'm glad I didn't find out at the school because I just feel rather appalled at the way they were told. They went in in groups of four, apparently, the friendship groups, and the doctor went round with his hand and finger, you got it, you haven't, you got it, you haven't. So you'd left school, and then what, you discover you were HIV positive? I was tested for it eventually, yes. And you didn't, at that stage, know where it came from, and you only put it together later? Well, we knew it was from the Factor Eight, but we didn't know which batch, and we still don't know for certain today. I mean, when I was at the school, they used every single brand of Factor Eight, as there were so many of us to look after. It was absolutely terrifying when I was told. We kept it to ourselves as a family, didn't tell anybody. But for quite a long time, I did fairly well. Then as my knees deteriorated, I found out I had to have both knees replaced. I had that done, and my health was going downhill a bit then. And I just started to get infections I was so scared and I felt so ill. And what are you hoping for from this inquiry? If we just give them satisfactory explanations as to what happened, why it happened, who made what decision and why, but also why have large numbers of very important files gone missing over the years. We suspect that they've been deliberately destroyed. I think there's been a bit of a cover-up at the top of government and I think many of us feel the same. They knew about it much earlier than they've admitted. I mean, this is slowly coming to light. But do you think they knew about it before you were infected? I think they knew that they were playing Russian roulette with the factor eight, let's put it like that. They knew it was coming from dubious sources in America. They knew that our own fractionation plants went to a very high quality. The government knew what it was buying. The drug companies knew what they were producing. I just found it incredible, really, that it was just allowed to carry on. Do you still feel angry about it? To some extent, but we're all getting older now, and I'm, I'm just glad to be here, but I want answers, not just myself and you know, the other people are still here, but you know, for the people who've lost maybe two of the sons to this. Many families have lost one, two, or even three family members through contaminated factor eight, and they've not really been told anything. That was Nicholas Sainsbury. Well, Jim Reed is our health correspondent. He's been following the story and has been watching the start of the evidence this morning and is w with me in the studio now. Jim, Jim, so what happened at the inquiry this morning? So we had some opening comments from the lead counsel to the inquiry, Jenny Richards QC. So this week, as you heard, the focus is completely on this school in Hampshire called Trelaws. She set out what they're going to be looking into. So she said, I mean, this is fairly obvious, but she said they were going to look into the treatments the boys had. She also said they're going to look into the information that was provided to parents and children as in her words commonly no such information was provided and also interestingly to the extent to which she said any research was being undertaken at the school and whether that was any driver to the treatment received and that's actually a complaint or a worry you hear from from a number of boys that I've spoken to that, that went to the school important to say I think uh, as, as you've heard earlier on in the report that the boys at the school were being treated at the haemophilia centre 
at the site that was run on the NHS. So that was run by NHS doctors and staff, not school staff. And in fact, many of the boys involved that I've spoken to are very complimentary about the care they got from the school itself. Speaking this morning, uh, the, uh, the lead counsel to the inquiry said, in fact, we won't be able to hear from any of the key clinicians who were involved at that NHS centre. As you said, all are now dead. So she said, we will have to piece together what happened from documents and memories of those who attended that school. OK, well, let's hear from one of the uh, pupils from Trelaws. Um, he was at the inquiry today. He wasn't giving evidence today. Uh, he, he gave evidence a couple of years ago. But he said uh, in a break in the hearing, he spoke to me and took me back to the moment that he was diagnosed with HIV, which was several years after leaving the school. At the time, we were only expected to live for two years at most. It's devastating. Absolutely devastating. You thought you'd die within a couple of years? That's what the doctor said. That's what our GP and hematologist further went on to say at a later date. You've got two years. Make the most of it. Just after I visited my GP, my wife went up to see her physician, and he basically said, get rid of the baby, because there's a great good chance it could be positive. You can't put it into words how devastating that was. What are you hoping from this committee, from this inquiry? Oh, we all like to see some sort of accountability. The evidence that's come out today proves gross wrongdoing. In my opinion, it's been a cover-up of unimaginable proportions uh, at the very heart of government. People made decisions. People um, signed off on things, importing blood products as cheap as possible. Personally, I want people held accountable and ultimately substantial compensation paid not only to the victims that have suffered this hell for 30, 40 years, but also to their families. And there are people still alive today who you think there can are, be proved yeah. knew what was going on? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Um, well, Jim is still here with me. Uh, and, Jim, just a couple of things that came out of it. One, of course, the stories for the boys who were there and how they were told. Although, as you say, they speak very fondly of the school, it was a fairly brutal time in terms of what happened to them. Brutal for, for a number of reasons. So uh, a number of the boys there were infected with various types of viral hepatitis, A, B and C. And then later on, really, the, the beginning of the 80s was when you heard these first reports of HIV or what, what would then be known as HIV starting to come through. And the, the boys that were infected with, with HIV, and it was roughly about two thirds of the, of, the, of the boys who have lost their lives, had to deal not just with the medical prognosis, which obviously in 1983-85 was terrible, but also with, with the attached stigma of living with the disease. So I heard from, from boys last week who, who were telling me that there were newspaper journalists parked outside the school gates. They, they went to go and uh, do, do their shopping at the corner shop and people would bark questions at them. Friends at home would refuse to play with them. So I think the psychological impact of, of living with, I don't want to kind of over I over dramatized the situation but back in the 1980s this really was a death sentence so the, the, the living with that was incredibly hard for, okay. for some of the boys involved and on that question of that they think there was a cover-up there's a difficulty isn't there given that so many people are dead now trying to get to the truth of what happened and why it might have happened well this is exactly why there's been demand for this public inquiry. We've had two inquiries before into the wider uh, infected blood scandal. They weren't public inquiries, so there wasn't the ability to kind of force people to hand over documents or to, to give evidence. So this is what the survivors hope now that they'll finally get some sort of answers. One thing that that's, they're particularly concerned about is that we didn't really heat treat this Factor 8, Factor 9 products to kill viruses until 1987. So there's some, some debate about we knew some risks were involved. You would have thought, you know, in the earlier part of the 1980s, why did it take long, so long, uh, to, to make sure that that product, that drug, that medicine they were using was clean? Right. Jim Reid, thank you very much. And it's just worth saying that the Health Secretary has said he wanted to make sure the voices of those affected are heard. And he said the government would pay compensation if the inquiry decided that it should.